You can't live in this world today and not be curious. In fact, if ever there was a time to hear from more than the usual suspects, it's now. This is the Carlos Watson Show. Maybe we'll surprise you. Maybe you'll be mad at us sometimes or inspired. Not only do I hope people will see more with the show, but I hope they'll do more and be more. People, the good stuff starts now. The color girls who consider politics. Carlos, you're in dangerous territory. They have run the Democratic game in D.C. for decades. You belong in the rooms where God puts you. Now the original squad talks Biden 2020. But it's time for a black woman. Why Kamala Harris? Tina Turner would have been my first choice, but of course she wasn't in the run. What needs to change? Black women have been leading, but we've been leading from the back as we push other people forward. If you want to dream big, you got to have courage. They are four of the most powerful political activists in the country. Mignon Moore, Donna Brazil, Leah Daughtry, and Yolanda Carraway. They have a fantastic new book that they published just a couple of years ago, but there's a lot to talk about today. And so how did you guys become friends? How did everyone meet? Well, we've all been involved in politics for a very long time. Now, I think we're at a point where we say politics is our advocation and not our vocation. But uh, Yolanda actually entered the business first. uh, And so maybe I should just throw this question to her because she has the most history and perhaps she might be the oldest. (laughs) <laughs> I am the oldest and I'm very proud of it <laughs> well we had all known each other from uh, the Jackson orbit I officially announced my candidacy to seek the nomination of the Democratic Party but I think when we started having dinners I had become uh, chief of staff at the party and I reached out to the girls to have dinner with me and to make sure I was doing the job the way it needed to be done and that I had the right set of advice and critique and all of that. So we started having dinner and we, it became a regular thing. They are kindred spirits whose bond is both personal and professional. Donna Brazil, Mignon Moore, Yolanda Carraway, and the Reverend Leah Daughtry are four of the most powerful African-American women in politics. Brazil is a veteran Democratic strategist and campaign manager who twice served as the interim chair of the Democratic National Committee. Moore is a political activist who cut her teeth in Chicago politics. She served as director of White House political affairs under President Bill Clinton and was considered part of the inner circle for Hillary Clinton's 2016 campaign. Yolanda Carraway, you're the director of the Washington office of the Jesse Jackson presidential campaign. For over 25 years, Yolanda Carraway has played a major role in shaping the goals and objectives of the National Democratic Party. And the Reverend Leah Daughtry is a nationally recognized political strategist and was CEO of the 2008 and the 2016 Democratic National Conventions. When Democrats say we the people, we mean all the people. These four women got into politics in the 1960s and 70s, and now they are considered veteran Washington insiders whose opinions matter. We are the color girls, and we're proud of it. Man, talk about somebody making big news. How about Joe Biden's choice to be his VP nominee? First of all, is the answer yes? The answer is absolutely (laughs) yes, Joe, and I am ready to work. Now, why Kamala Harris? You know, I just think she's been tested on -hmm. the national stage, and and she's whip smart. She's got a great legal mind. You know, Kamala's never lost an election except when she ran for president, but up to that point, I know people— have issues with her record as a, as a prosecutor. But I think people have to understand that as a prosecutor, she was protecting the victims. You know, some people do need to go to jail. Yes, right. Um, that, that was her job, to protect the yeah. mothers who had lost their sons, who their kids had been killed by, by gun violence or, or by police violence or whatever. So I think people need to understand better where she was coming from. I would say that I think that Kamala Harris has what it takes to help us win. Uh, her, her background, her mind, her uh, proven ability to run this gauntlet of presidential campaigning. I think she brings something extra to the table. 
And frankly, she's the future, you know, and I think she has, I actually think she has been vilified a lot more than I had anticipated. It's really quite surprised me. And I don't know why that is. Yeah. What's interesting is what this whole debate around Which one has surfaced? The term ambitious is a loaded one when it comes to women. It's an accurate charge in this instance. As we listen to the pundit talk about ambition as a dirty word, talk about who rubs who the wrong way, and it's really quite ugly. It just reminds us how far we as women, we as black women have to go to be seen as equal. What's wrong with a little ambition? We're talking about a business that is all about ambition, that is all about asking people to choose you. That's what I would do, that's what I have done, and I know how to do it. But when a woman does it, when a black woman does it, then suddenly you're out of the confines of the place that this system has set up. There was nobody more insulting to Biden than she was. She said horrible things about him. But I'm confident that Senator Harris would be able to overcome that and be the best person to help us win in November so that we can then govern. All four of you have been in the room when people have made that decision to choose their number two. And so you have more insight than just the average pundit. Talk about that and how that shaped your journey. My experience in 2000 with Al Gore was that Warren Christopher did all of the homework. He did the vetting with his team of lawyers and others, accountants. They look at everything to make sure that this person have the background and the personal stuff, uh, et cetera. And so when Gore went around the table, we were down to three candidates and we all weighed in. Tina Turner would have been my first choice, but of course she wasn't in the running. But because <laughs> Tina wasn't in the running, I said Joe Lieberman, and I was the only one for Lieberman in the room. But I felt good until 4.30 that morning when he called me and said, it's Lieberman. I said, oh, my God, what the hell? Uh, Yeah. (laughs) And I want to say this. I am grateful and proud. I'm grateful as a Democrat, but proud that Joe Biden has considered the number of black women that he has over the last couple of months because I was there when Walter Mondale selected Geraldine Ferraro. Not one black woman was under consideration. And there were many black women qualified, but nobody called us. Joe Biden has called upon black women. Mignon, what did you see uh, being involved in Secretary Clinton's 2016 run in her selection of Tim Kaine? Well, we had a similar process in terms of we didn't have a big selection committee. We had a legal vetting committee. And so they, you know, there were lots of names being bantied about, but it really came down to just a a few. I think Elizabeth Warren was one of the finalists. Cory Booker was one of the finalists. And it really did come down to Hillary's choice. And I will tell you, many of the senior staff people actually rallied around Cory at the time because we saw something in him that we didn't see in some of the other candidates when they com- campaigned with him. But I think she needed something to calm down. You know, we were we were like head over heels about emails at the time. It was so much controversy around her. She was just trying to calm the ticket down. I was tired after last night, but I'm awake now. And Tim Kaine was a fine choice, but you also have to measure the enthusiasm of your electric when you're doing that. And I think it's particularly important for Joe Biden because not only do you have the confluence of COVID and race hitting each other, it's also going to impact how we get to the polls and which way we're voting. Well, you know, Yolanda, I want to ask you about that because we're less than 100 days out and I don't know a single person who's volunteering for Uncle Joe. Not a single person. Now, part of that's COVID, part of it's staying inside. Are you worried about an enthusiasm gap? And then if you are, who do you think will bring that enthusiasm? Is it Senator Harris? Is she the one? You know, I I think there are more volunteers than we think there are. It's hard to tell because we're not in person anymore. But I look back to Mondale and Ferraro. She boosted him. He was always so much better when he was on the road with her. You you remember that? I mean, he he was more alive and he was more animated. I think Kamala will bring that to Joe, I really do. I think they make a great visual. How is 
the conversation around feminism uh, changed over the last six months as Black Lives Matter has elevated? Is there a different kind of conversation, Leah, that you are finding black and white women are having about politics? Well, I think uh, that what we've seen both in this moment of Black Lives Matter, but then also through this presidential cycle where there were so many talented women who were seeking the nomination. I think the age old conversation about how black women and white women relate to each other is one that has been going on for time immemorial. Uh, what Black Lives Matter now has elevated that conversation to really talk about what do good allies look like? And I think we're seeing, as you, as you look at the rallies that are happening right now, and you see the diversity of people who are showing up uh, to say Black Lives Matter, even in cities and towns and inlets where there aren't any black people. Black Lives Matter. However, our feminism should have kicked in on the white side in 216, but it kicked in for black women. We saw yeah. a qualified white yeah. woman and white women decided that she wasn't good enough. So I'm hoping that our white allies, our Latina, Latinx, our LGBT community will look up if they are female or whatever they choose to call themselves and say, listen, we're going to do this thing right this time. We're not going to wink it because black women are going to show up. We have not had the luxury of these labels of feminism and so forth because feminism is supposed to mean that I can make my own choices about my life, but we have not had our agency all of the time. So if feminism is gonna be feminism, then it has to include the definition of all of us. And for a long time, black women have been leading, but we've been leading from the back as we push other people forward. And now we are at an age and in an age where black women are taking their place out front, in front, and leading movements from the front. Not because other people can't do it, but because we know how to lead. We've been doing it for years, and it's time for us to get the credit for what we know how to do. Well, you know, I was I was literally just about to ask you about that. How hopeful are you that black men will be supportive of that? I always have hope in my brother. You know, I'm hopeful, especially as you see uh, younger legislators, younger folks taking the lead, like Mayor Baraka in Newark and Lieutenant Governor Mandela in Wisconsin. He is a story of resilience. It is a story of hope and it is a story of opportunity. And now you have women who, because of their desire to serve the country, because they possess leadership qualities and capabilities, they're now stepping up to the plate. I mean, in 2012, we had 48 Black women decide to run for Congress. This past cycle, 122. 122. And 60 Black women will qualify to be congressional candidates. We don't make up that much of the population, but because of our civic uh, participation, Black women are the key. And we are the future of the Democratic Party. And we have put more Democrats, I can break it down by Senate races, by gubernatorial races. And of course, Leah can tell you how much money, Yolanda can tell you what the message was, and Mignon can tell you the strategy. Because we've been at the table, we've been in the room. All four of us have been blessed because we have had had black male mentors, we've had black yeah, women yeah. mentors, we've actually had white male mentors. Yeah. So, you know, this whole issue of being perceived as a leader in this country, you know, that's, I think, part of why Hillary did not win is they don't have a visual of what that looks like. So, Carlos, you have a show. You will help us paint that picture. Thank you. <laughs> get personal if I can, because you all work so hard, but, but I sense that there's also a, a joy and a love and a zest for this work. What is it, for people who are not political junkies, why do, you, why do each of you enjoy politics so much? For me, I think it's been public service. I mean, I know that sounds a little bit trite, but I mean, we came through an era where serving people was the highest compliment you could get. And the greatest joy we get is to see these young people coming up behind us in all these different fields, and we just go good and faithful serving well done. I mean, it's that's what we, that's my joy. I mean, here I was, a Southern girl. I grew up loving 
these fierce freedom fighters. I grew up wanting to be just like them. I wanted to be them. The march did more to dramatize the indignities and the injustices that Negro people continue to face in the state of Alabama and many other sections of the South. We're part of that long line of activists who wanted to open doors, find chairs, even if it was folding chairs, and to bring about that day that they all gave their lives. They turned around quickly, and the next thing I saw was Malcolm falling back in a dead faint. They gave their lives so that we can go to the beloved community, that we could see the promised land, that we could reach the mountaintops. And guess what? Knowing these sisters the way I do, if, I, if I'm ever in the battle and I gotta get up a mountain, I want them with me because we can pull and we know how to push. And some of us cuss. Some of us cuss. <laughs> I'm gonna come around to everybody and I want quick responses to the following questions. Lee, I'm coming to you first. Give me your favorite book other than the Bible. The Temple of My Familiar by Alice Walker. Yolanda, most interesting place you've ever been? Oh, Africa, Ghana. Donna, the most talented politician you've ever met? Bill Clinton. Big Bill. He can tell when he's in the room what the spirit of the conversation should be. So yes, Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton, yeah. Uh, Mignon, most interesting person that you've ever had a chance to meet? Ava DuVernay. Mm -hmm. I think because she has taken her art and combined it with her activism in such a profound and fearless way. Leah, who's your favorite musician of all time? Prince. His royal badness. His royal badness, oh yes. Yolanda, your favorite dessert? Ice cream. Donna, people who think they know you, what would surprise them to find out about you? That I'm 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 an introvert. That's not true. But you know, I got an outgoing personality, so I can make up for it. Well, you're an introvert, an extrovert. extrovert. You, you're not joking. You mean that for real? I don't know if I would use the word introvert, but she definitely has a spirit of aloneness and loving it. That's who I am. I so loved having everybody on the show today. Um, I know I kept you longer than I was supposed to. They've been in my ear for the last half hour, uh, but I pretended like I couldn't hear it. They weren't telling you to wrap us up, were they? Even if they did, I didn't hear it, so. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and let them know I still want the good sequel. Answer. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Thank you. I'm gonna look forward to seeing you soon. God bless you. Thank good you. Luck, okay. Thank you. All right, be safe. Hey, tune into The Carlos Watson Show. It's like no other. You're going to enjoy it every weekday on YouTube.